Good day, everyone, and welcome to our UIDA Awards of Excellence uh, finalist webinar this afternoon or morning, depending on where you are. This is a webinar designed to provide support to our finalists as we approach the home stretch before the 2018 Annual Summit, where each of you will present your project or initiative in front of your peers. Uh, first of all, let me congratulate you all on becoming finalists. My name is Frank Satil, and I am the Deputy Director for UIDA and I will serve as your host for today's webinar. As you know, the Awards of Excellence recognizes leading edge initiatives in university-based economic development and encourages their adoption among UIDA members. So now, before we get started, a couple things I want you to keep in mind. We do have a questions tab on the right side of your screen, and I'd like you to use that. If you have any questions, um, we will address specific questions at the end of the presentation, at the end of the webinar. Um, if for any reason you are having technical difficulties, please use the chat feature, which is also located on the right side. Um, everybody will be on mute except for myself and our panel of three presenters. Uh, more information about the Awards of Excellence program can be found on the web at awards.universityeda.org. And today's webinar is being recorded, so a link will be distributed to all finalists within the next few days, um, those that are attending currently and those that weren't able to make it. So without further delay, let me introduce our panel for today's webinar. We have Julia Potter, who is our Awards of Excellence Committee Chair from California State University at Northridge. We have Wally Meyer from the University of Kansas, who is a Awards of Excellence Committee member and judge, and also a 2016 uh, category leader. And we have Dr. Mona Bale from the University of Georgia, who won an award last year in the place category. So I'd like to thank all three of you for being with us today, and I will now turn over the presentation to Julia. Thank you, Frank, very much. Uh, hello, everybody. And on behalf of the UIDA Awards of Excellence Committee, I want to once again congratulate you on being selected as a finalist in our award process. Your projects are excellent, and we appreciate the quality of the submissions. The purpose of this webinar this, today is to help you prepare your presentation and ensure that you put your best foot forward in the coming weeks as a finalist for the 2018 UIDA Awards of Excellence. We want to help you to be your best. So here are some of the highlights that we're going to cover in the webinar. We're going to review key deadlines, including those that should uh, hopefully have been already completed. Uh, we're going to uh, go over some of the logistics of the award presentations, and we're going to explain the judging criteria and how winners are selected. Over the years, we've observed what has worked and what has not worked for finalists as they prepare for their presentations at the summit. We will share some of those insights with you today. We're also going to discuss the table exhibit opportunity and some reminders about campaigning. But most of all, this webinar will also provide an opportunity for you, the finalists, to ask any questions that you have. And we want those questions to help ensure that you're comfortable with the process over these next several weeks. All of us will do our best to answer your questions. So please make a note as you move through the webinar, and we'll cover all of those questions uh, towards the end. The webinar itself should last no more than an hour. So let's start with those important dates. First, a couple of key dates and deadlines that you should have uh, already been aware of. But as a reminder, if you have not already registered yourself, your presentation team, and any fellow travelers for the summit, please go to the UIDA website at universityeda.org and register today. Please do that. Also, be sure you've reserved a room at the uh, summit hotel. Now, by September 15th, you should send both a project-related photo and a logo in vector format, please. And please send that to Frank. Uh, examples of vector formats are um, the .eps files or Illustrator files. If you need help with this, 
please ask your marketing uh, department for support, or you can always contact us, contact Frank. He has all of those answers. The deadline for sending your completed presentation in PowerPoint and a PDF flyer to uh, events, I'm sorry, to the uh, events at universityeda.org, that is due by October 1st. Now, the week before the summit, be sure to prepare and, and pack what you're going to need, including a backup of your presentation, flyers, tabletop display, materials, all of those things. Reminder of the dates of the summit, October 21 through 24. The awards presentation will be on Monday the 22nd and Tuesday the 23rd, with the awards banquet the evening of Tuesday the 23rd. So now let's take a look at the logistics. Uh, and bear in mind that uh, this schedule is, is tentative. Uh, any changes, uh, you know, please keep checking the, the website. So each category will have one hour and 15 minutes to present, one finalist after another. For the first time ever, we have a category with five finalists, and that category was talent plus place. Finalists in this session will need to be especially mindful of their time to allow all finalists equal opportunity to present their initiative to the audience. So if you have questions regarding the schedule, we will take those at the end of the webinar as part of the question and answer time. So now let's take a look at the uh, logistics. Um, you will be presenting to a room of UEDA Summit attendees of varying backgrounds. Some of um, the category presentations will be occurring at the same time at some uh, at the same time as some of the panel discussions. So you can estimate about 75 to 100 attendees in your session. Your presentation should be in PowerPoint format and it will be preloaded onto a laptop in the presentation room prior to the conference. A screen, a projector, and a microphone will also be present in the room. If you have a special request for your presentation, please contact the events team at events at universityeda.org and they will see if they can accommodate your request. Uh, we can't guarantee we're working with the hotel, but please let us know well in advance if you do have a special request. Uh, so again, each of these categories will have one hour and 15 minutes on the conference agenda. And that is the time for finalist presentations. Therefore, your presentation should be no longer than 12 minutes. Again, your presentation should be no longer than 12 minutes. Uh, there's also going to be time for a five-minute question and answer following the presentation. Finalists will present in this manner one right after another, completing the full hour. A UEDA board member or a committee member will be present to keep time and moderate each session. Warnings will be given at certain intervals and presentations will be cut off at 12 minutes. No one can go over 12 minutes. It's recommended that you use no more than 8 to 10 slides for brevity. There will be 3 to 5 finalists in each category. Regardless of the number of finalists in the category, each presentation will only be 12 minutes. Each presenter only has 12 minutes to present and that includes, uh, I'm sorry, and then there is a five minute question and answer after the conclusion of the 12 minutes. So now we're going to talk about uh, the category leaders selection. Ballots will be distributed to the attendees of the session to rank the presentations viewed, and the attendees will be ranking on the same judging criteria used by our Awards of Excellence Committee to determine the finalists. We will review these categories on the next slide. The moderator of the session will collect those votes at the end of the session. 
audience members from presenting institutions should not be permitted to vote in sessions where their institution is presenting. Again, if there's an audience member from an affiliated institution presenting during that session, they may not participate in the voting. It is also important to, uh, to note that in order to cast a ballot, the audience members should be present to, to, uh, to view all of the finalists in that particular category. Again, we want the audience to come at the beginning, hear it all, and be able to vote on all of the presentations. So next, let's talk about the table exhibits at the summit. Uh, the tables will be available to you, um, and they will be organized by category. But it's a shared space. Uh, the location of the tables will be in the exhibit hall in the conference uh, hotel. And we ask that for your display items, a small tabletop uh, or a, a retractable uh, banner uh, printed materials related to your project that some of the attendees can take away with them. And uh, during the breaks, during the receptions, uh, it would be uh, ideal to have somebody actually staffing the table who can answer questions. Now, this is important. We're going to talk about the campaign guidelines. Um, summit sponsorships or um, the advertisements must not mention the initiative under evaluation. Uh, we do not allow email solicitations, payola, or any other form of campaigning or bribery. It's not acceptable. Uh, distribution of flash drives or other promotional items, uh, candy, or anything else during the presentation itself is not allowed. But you may distribute these items in the exhibit hall area after your presentation, not before. So if you have any questions regarding our campaigning guidelines, please contact uh, Tim Hines, our executive director. You see his email, tim.hines at universityeda.org. So let's review the categories. Again, um, we have talent place and innovation, and then the, uh, the crossover areas of those three uh, areas. Uh, talent is the cradle to grave human capital and talent development. Place is community connected institutions and stewardship for vibrant communities. And innovation, research, creative works, problem solving, and entrepreneurship. Now, our judging criteria, again, uh, this is the judging criteria that was used to select the finalists. And this will be the criteria for the summit attendees who are in the session watching your presentation. And that criteria is based on originality and creativity, impact of your project, leadership and collaboration, strong evidence of that, replicability, scalability, and sustainability. And then we have an area that's subjective, uh, your, the presentation skills, the, the impact of the actual presentation in the moment. That will also be part of the judging criteria. So some common questions that we've received over the years. Um, when and where do I distribute my handouts and marketing materials? Again, uh, we can review that at the end. Uh, and this webinar is also going to be available on our website. Uh, what do I need for my booth and exhibit area? How will questions and answers be handled? Again, there'll be a UEDA committee member or board member in the session who will serve that role. Uh, will we have time to practice? Can others from my institution vote? When will we find out category leaders? And what do we win? So we hope this webinar will answer those questions for you. So with that, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Wally Meyer, who will give you some good tips for success. Thanks, Julia. Um, folks, this is uh, Wally Meyer. I'm 
at the uh, University of Kansas and as Frank indicated, a past participant. Uh, one comment before um, I offer some uh, thoughts for your consideration regarding successful presentations. Um, the, the most important piece of this is um, uh, probably to involve yourself as, as thoroughly as you possibly can because the folks that you're going to meet um, at this uh, summit are really extraordinary and can be of significant value in terms of not only personal learning but also in augmenting your program's reach. Um, so um, for what it's worth. Um, let me start out by saying you have two objectives in your presentation at least according to the thoughts that we have put together here amongst a variety of several presentations that have been successful as well as the research available. Those objectives are number one, to educate, and number two, to persuade. Since your concept or your new program is new and creative, uh, the audience needs to be educated about it, and since you're competing with others, the audience needs to be persuaded that your entry is superior to others, hence the importance of the two objectives. The first of these two objectives, education, can really only be achieved to your, if your audience understands the program. While it's important to ensure the creativity and the genius of your initiative is registered, it's arguably even more important to make sure that your message is understood. So the best way to keep that um, uh, assurance in mind is relatively simple and to follow um, a well-researched order of presentation. So first, let's look at educating your audience in a simple, understandable presentation approach. What I'm gonna suggest to you um, is an order of slide presentations. And again, this is totally um, at your option um, in design to improve um, uh, education and persuadability but by an understanding on the part of the audience who will ultimately be your deciders, your voters, uh, in terms of their receptivity of what you have to say. So um, for your consideration, the ideal order of presentation um, follows the natural, what we think to be the natural logic flow of the audience, specifically, Number one, identify the problem you are addressing. Next, identify the solution to that problem. Thirdly, identify the how your solution is unique or differentiated from others that are already working in this space. And then fourthly, identify the potential value which will be generated by implementing your solution. Each of those subjects should be addressed on a separate slide using whatever verbiage plus uh, data or graphics uh, that will reinforce the point. Since I ran through those pretty quickly, let me repeat the preferred slide order. First, identify the problem you're addressing. Next, identify the solution to that problem. Thirdly, identify how your solution will be unique or differentiated from others uh, that are competing in that space. And then fourthly, identify the potential value which will be generated by implementing your solution. The last obviously is important uh, to avoid generating a who cares. So at this point in the presentation, you can expect that the audience will be in lockstep with you, hopefully nodding affirmatively that they get it, that in fact they understand. So we can assume that they are now educated. Your next objective then becomes uh, making sure that you have an opportunity to persuade them um, and you'll use the balance of your slides to persuade your audience that your program can in fact successfully address the problem you first identified and that you do so uniquely. How you accomplish this is really up to you and should reflect the special characteristics of your program. I'll give you some examples um, that, again, you might consider. Some of the programs can be best proven um, and be most persuasively presented with the use of data sequences, um, data to and information to support logically um, how um, your program is going to be effective. Alternatively, some other programs can be most persuasively presented using an emotional appeal. 
um, often we've seen um, where um, there are uh, programs that um, affect uh, economic injustices, and those obviously lend themselves to this kind of an emotional appeal approach. Some other programs can use analogies to already proven successful programs to suggest that due to their similarity, they too will be successful. And some programs are really just most persuasive when they're evidencing the results that have already been achieved. If you have the advantage of having already pilot tested um, your program, this might be a perfect opportunity to be able to indicate that it already works and what you're looking to do is expand. Um, therefore, persuasion ability is, is more naturally achieved. Finally, or at least the final thought here is that the last slide should provide a recap of the most salient points that you want the audience to remember. Alternatively, presenters who use the last slide for questions or graphically to display a question mark or use um, type to thank their audience are really wasting a most valuable opportunity to cement the key education and persuasion points. Why? Because this, this slide will likely remain on screen for the longest of any during your Q&A period. So its message has the greatest opportunity to both educate and persuade, which as you'll recall, was, were your original objectives. Um, these thoughts, um, I'm happy to share these thoughts and any others um, if you'd like to write me at W. Meyer Jr at ku.edu, that's W-M-E-Y-E-R-J-R -E -E at ku.edu. If I can be of further help, I'm happy to do so. Frank, back to you. Okay, thank you, Wally. We are going to now introduce Dr. Mona Bale, who is a award winner in 2017 in the place category, and she is going to take you through her award-winning presentation from last year. You would just bear with me one quick second. All right. Can you see my screen? I can yes. see it. Fantastic. Hurricane Sandy made landfall on the coast of New Jersey in late October 2012. Dennis Moore was working that evening, leaving his wife Glenda Moore to ride out the storm at home with their two children, ages two and four. As afternoon transitioned into evening and winds built in intensity, the Moore's home, like most in the area, lost its power. At that point, Glenda decided to load the children in the family vehicle and drive to her sister's house in the nearby borough of Brooklyn. Glenda took the most commonly traveled route to Brooklyn, Father Capodanno Boulevard, which runs along the coast and leads directly to the Verrazano Narrows Bridge. Under normal circumstances, this would have been a relatively short trip, 30 minutes tops, but these were not normal circumstances. The National Hurricane Center had been repeatedly warning that, the Sandy, that Sandy's rainfall would be accompanied by a storm surge of up to 11 feet above normal tide levels, something that would render most coastal roads impassable. And indeed, as Glenda came a mile off the bridge, Capodanno became engulfed by Sandy's rising storm surge, stalling her vehicle. She took the children in her arms, left the car, and tried to wade to the safety of some houses she saw in the distance. Glenda survived, but the children did not. A powerful wave swept them from her arms, and they were lost to the storm. While the loss of more family was perhaps the most heartbreaking news that emerged after Hurricane Sandy, it was by no means unique. That same night, 20 others died from drowning in Staten Island alone. 
Superstorm Sandy caused nearly $70 billion in damage to the U.S. economy, second only to Katrina. Three catastrophic hurricanes have struck the United Coast uh, dead, uh, coastline only in the past couple of months. Harvey, Irma, Maria, the estimated costs of damages caused by those hurricanes are comparable to that of Katrina. The World Economic Forum is an international nonprofit that engages public and private sectors from across the world. And according to a, a global risk report that was uh, launched in 2017 by the World Economic Forum, extreme weather events and natural disasters are the highest risks to, hum to humanity in terms of their likelihood of occurrence and scale of impact. So the question is, what is the role of higher education in this ever-changing and uncertain world? 50 years ago, the federal government passed the National Sea Grant College Act of 1966 to establish federal state partnerships that turn research into action by supporting science-based, environmentally sustainable practices that ensure coastal communities remain engines of economic growth in a rapidly changing world. Run by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the Sea Grant Program is a network of 33 university-based programs that are located in each of the coastal U.S. states, Great Lakes Region, Puerto Rico, and Guam. If you represent a land-grant university in the coastal state, it is likely that your university is a Sea Grant university as well. So how does Sea Grant approach these challenges? Sorry about that. I think I lost my slides there. So in our projects, as, as I'm trying to pull the presentation back up, in our projects, we use a participatory uh, process, decision-making process, where the community prioritizes what assets are most vulnerable to flooding and sea level rise. They then identify possible adaptation solutions, and we analyze the cost and benefits of these actions. In many communities, these are among the first conversations that the local government officials and residents have been openly having about the impacts of sea level rise on their, in their communities. There are two aspects that make Sea Grant efforts very unique. One relates to the design of the project, that is how we gather information, what expertise is represented on the project team, and who we listen to in the community. The second relates to concentrated outreach efforts that begin in most cases uh, even before the project is funded, engaging citizens, decision makers, and targeted community audiences. So we often think about sea level rise as a future impact, something that will impact our children or grandchildren. However, all of the coastal communities that we work with throughout the Southeast are already experiencing challenges such as streets and properties flooding at high tides or during naturally occurring king tides, rising flood insurance rates and eroding beaches. When a community floods, it can compromise drinking water, overwhelm storm water systems and cut off evacuation routes. As flood insurance rates rise, it can affect the affordability of the housing. And it can challenge the very fabric of the community. Local governments are therefore having to face tough choices and overwhelming costs in, for, in terms of planning for future. Sandy, Harvey, Matthew, Irma illustrate the excessive damage and life-threatening situations that flooding can bring. This photo, is uh, was taken during king tide on october 27 2015. this is the only road in georgia that connects the city of tybee island uh, Ty, uh, the city of tybee island to uh, savannah a little of over four years ago tybee island officials local government um, got in touch with georgia sea grant and asked us to devise solutions for rising sea levels on tybee island we partnered with them and we were funded. Um, we were given a, an award from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration to, to, to tackle climate adaptation planning over a 50 year horizon. Tybee was one of the few communities throughout the country chosen 
and it was one of the first in Georgia to plan for sea level rise. That initial effort has now grown to include communities up and down the United States um, southeast coast. So let me just provide uh, some context fo focusing on coastal Georgia. This is data taken from NOAA tide gauge around uh, at Fort Pulaski, just outside Savannah. It has measured nine inch sea level rise since 1935, and the local trend is, is around one foot over 100 years. Nuisance flooding is also becoming an increasing problem in coastal areas. Uh, looking at local tide gauge data, the rate of nuisance flooding around Tybee Island have steadily risen over the past 34 years. To compound these hazards, research by a couple of colleagues here at the University of Georgia and colleagues at, at, at Stetson University in Florida suggests that there would be anywhere from 62,000 to 160,000 people living in coastal Georgia who would be at risk for, from sea level rise between 3.3 to 6.6 .6 feet by 2100. So sea level rise, in, in the projects that we work with, sea level rise are selected by the community based on their perception of risk and comfort level in planning. So these are the three different sea level rise chosen by the city of Tybee Island in the sea level rise adaptation plan that we helped them put together. The lowest was six inches and they, the city felt comfortable planning between this range of six inches to 31 inches over the next 50 years. So uh, remember, if you recall the picture that I showed, um, I'm sorry, this keeps... Um, uh, dying on me, but uh, remember the one picture that I showed in the beginning of my presentation, which was the uh, the uh, the U.S. Highway 80. That is the only road that connects Tybee Island with um, Savannah. This road is expected to be under a sea level, low sea, sea level rise scenario. It's expected to be 50 hours underwater, and under a high sea level rise scenario, it's expected to be underwater for over 1,200 hours. So um, we were able to put together uh, along, put together a team of interdisciplinary scientists together with our extension specialists, and um, put together a sea level rise adaptation plan for the city of Tybee Island. This also happens to be the first sea level rise adaptation plan that Georgia came up with. Some of the adaptation options that were chosen by the, the researchers and the local officials and stakeholders included elevating pump houses, uh, elevating US Highway 80, stormwater retrofits, uh, so through the sea level rise adaptation plan, we have been able to reach out to more than 4,000 people. This includes over 70 graduate and doctoral students. Our data is being now used in planning for beach renourishment and uh, considered in the modification of US Highway 80. That is the only road off, on and off the island. Tybee has also installed uh, tide gauges to prevent backflow. In fact, this level this was so successful that it's uh, the the adaptation plan has been featured on the United States uh, Climate Resilience website. Um, it has um, uh, we have had several senators come down to Georgia and have a look at it. The city of St. Mary's, which is on the border of Georgia and Florida, came to us and wanted us to help them do the same thing that we did for Tybee Island. That is planned for sea level rise for the city of St. Mary's. That project has been completed too. I just wanted to highlight very briefly a couple of uh, impacts that the sea level rise adaptation plan has had so far. It's not only helped save lives, but this is the economic impact that the sea level rise adaptation plan has had in the city of uh, Tybee Island. It has enabled savings of over $3 million in flood control benefits. This includes a discount of uh, nearly $700,000 in flood insurance for property owners on the island. The St. Mary's Resilience Plan, which is complete too, um, it, it offered, uh, it resulted in savings of over $100 per household in flood insurance premiums um, citywide. And um, so just uh, highlighting another uh, impact that uh, the resilience plan has had in the city of St. Mary's, um, it is upwards of $90,000 annually now.
So with that, I'll conclude my remarks. I do have, I did show a video towards the end of my presentation. I hope that Frank can uh, share that slide. My apologies once again for the, the technical difficulties there. Thank you very much, Mona. Appreciate that. And I do have a link to Mona's video. Uh, and you can see it on your screen right now. The link is a little bit unwieldy. So uh, if you also go to YouTube and search for University of Georgia Marine Extension and Georgia Sea Grant, A Tale of Two Cities, it comes up right at the top of the search results. It's available there. It's a nice minute and a half or minute 45 second video highlighting the program. So with that, we will move into questions. I've got a few here. Uh, we'll start with the first question about the timing, because there are one category with three finalists and one with five, and the category with five occurs on the second day of presentations. Will that session be cut short in any way? And the answer is no. Uh, each presenter, as long as they stick to their 12-minute presentation and five-minute Q&A will not be rushed through. We will extend that session as needed so that everybody gets a fair and equal amount of time to do their presentation. A second question we have is about the graphic requirements. Um, you'll notice in your finalist packet that we like to publicize your, your achievements. And in order to do that, we've requested a, a high-resolution image of your project in action, preferably. So what we're looking for is uh, people engaged with the community or engaged in your project. And the higher resolution, the better. The, the uh, packet calls for 1920 by 1080. That's a typical high-definition uh, TV screen pixel ratio. If you have any issues coming up with, with high resolution images, please contact me at frank.sotil, S-O-T-T-I-L-E, at universityeda.org, and I can help you through with either photographs, suggestions, or um, even if you have problems with vector, uh, getting vector graphics of your institutional logos. Uh, we can work with quite a bit, but we need to have the best that you can offer because we want to put forth your best look. Uh, I have one more question. It is about presentations that have sensitive information in them. Uh, the answer to this is we put all presentations on SlideShare after the summit is over. And there are certain cases in the past where we've had finalists that had sensitive or proprietary information in their presentations that they would not like to be publicized. So if you have something like that in your initiative, please uh, either send one presentation that is marked for public consumption that we can put up on the website, and you can present your full presentation at the summit, or if you would like to not have your presentation public at all on SlideShare, just let us know that in advance so that we can uh, take care of that for you. We don't want anybody to be uh, reluctant to present knowing that something may come out that they would prefer not to. I have one more question, or a couple more here. Uh, they'd like, people would like to see the schedule again. I will bring that up. Just bear with me one second for when the sessions take place. Okay, almost there. It's backing up a little bit. Okay, here is the tentative schedule of what categories take place when. And then the final question I have, unless somebody else wants to, to send me something, is how can we access this recorded webinar? When the webinar is complete, I will be posting 
the recording and the link of how to reach the recording to the UIDA website. And I will also be sending out a notification to all attendees of when it will be available. Probably no later than Monday, I would say. So if there are no further questions, uh, I'd like to thank Julia, Wally, and Mona, and of course, the finalists for attending today. Julia, if you have anything further to add? Uh, I don't, but um, again, congratulations to all. And uh, we are here to answer questions you in this webinar, and I hope you, you noted in your, uh, your packet, uh, there's email addresses to contact us. By all means, don't hesitate. Reach out to Frank. Uh, reach out to the events team. And uh, as I say, we are here to help you be your best, do your best. This is such an important part of the summit, and we are exceptionally proud of your work and proud to be able to showcase it on our on our nationally recognized summit. So see you all in Milwaukee. Actually, Julie, I have one question that just came in. So if you'll permit oh, very me. Very good. Uh, we have a question about presentation tables, and especially for the talent and place category, where there will be five presenters or five finalists. Uh, will you all be sharing the same table? The short answer is yes, but I believe that we will be able to make some sort of accommodation given that your category is a little more full than the others. So I would put that question on hold until we have a better idea logistically what the hotel will be able to help us with. So I would say we would like to probably offer you a little bit more space so that you're not all cramped together. So that's the short answer, uh, pending further investigation. And with that, I believe that's our final question. And I once again thank you, and we're looking forward to seeing you all in Milwaukee. Thank you very much.